and I had a dollar I was going to give, and uh, nobody wrote me the offering plate. <laughs> <laughs> I started to add four more to it, but I knew I was going to get it all anyway, so I just... <laughs> Keep the burden that God wants to reproduce in my heart, His burden, not mine, to see this country experience a mighty moving of God. And I happen to believe it's a possibility, and it's our only hope, is an interruption and an invasion of a holy God upon our country today. Well, I'm going to preach my coat off. Is that all right? Okay. You told me I could. And hold that while I preach, Doc. Hey. <laughs> I hadn't done this in a long time. And especially, I never thought I'd do it here. Amen. <laughs> Somebody get my picture now. Amen. And be sure and get the good side. You'll probably hunt it for the rest of the service. Joshua chapter 7, the seventh chapter of the book of Joshua. And I hope you'll hear me tonight because I believe in the pews of this auditorium tonight is the power to change this whole state with a mighty moving of God. Joshua chapter 7. And pray as I preach the word of God. Dr. Patterson, I love you and your sweet wife Dorothy. Thank God for both of you. What a thrill to have you as friends and a joy to be associated with people that believe and walk according to the Word of God, a desire to please the Lamb of God. Joshua 7, I'll get right in the Word. I'm only going to read verse 1 and preach the whole chapter. <laughs> However, I will uncouple it when the time comes, and that'll be 9.30. <laughs> Somebody said, well, I'm leaving. Well, I can hit a moving target. I've done it many times. <laughs> Verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabda, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Two words stand out in this first verse that sets the pattern for the whole chapter. Two words, accursed and anger. I, I want you to understand when we talk about the anger of God, we are not talking about an emotion, something that God works up to like we do. You know, we work up to getting mad. We have to have something to make us get mad. Most of us, some of us are born that way and threaten to stay that way. But when we talk about God, we're talking about an attribute. Man, one of the 12 of the greatest sermons I ever heard in my life is Dr. A.W. Tozier's sermons on the attributes of God. So much is said about Jesus and so much is said about the Holy Spirit, but there's not much being said about who God is. And because of that, most people have a God no bigger than their brain. Now, isn't that a big one? <laughs> they had Abdul Jabbar, whom I consider one of the greatest basketball players that ever lived. I love to watch him play. He was something. But one day they asked him, and you know, it's amazing how... Everybody that excels in sports or Hollywood or in some uh, world system, uh, they think that their authority is on everything. So they were interviewing on TV and they said, Abdul, why did you move from Catholicism to Muslims? He said, because I couldn't understand a three-headed God. Well, they won't let me on television, so I holler through it. <laughs> Hey, I, hey, when somebody says something like that, I wish that somebody was there to answer that dude. Amen? Amen. What do you mean a three-headed God? And you know what? I hollered through the TV and I said, Abdul, 
I'd hate to have a God no bigger than you could understand. But our concept of God is just a little bit bigger than us. And that's the way we think of it. But ladies and gentlemen, I am talking about the God, the one and only God, whom beside Him there is none other. He exists in Himself. He Everything holds together by His power. In fact, the heavens is His throne and the earth is His footstool. He sits on the circle of the earth. He holds everything from eternity to eternity by His own marvelous power. And when God says He's angry, it means it's an attribute of God towards sin. I am sick and tired of this nation trying to adjust all sin to where if they can't do anything about it, they just make it legal. Amen. Amen. And that's the whole way it is with a social society. If you can't enforce the law, just degrade it and change it and bring the morals down to where we can accept what's going on. But I want you to know, folks, we can't accept sin because we look at things from God's viewpoint, not from ours. There's a lot of things that I think is all right. And you know what I found out about myself? Usually, what I think sin is, is what I don't do. <laughs> I was preaching one night, Dr. Patterson, in a meeting, and I was on gossip. I mean, I was, I mean, I was on dancing. I was lowering the boom on dancing. Man, I really was. Of course, you know, I'm the old-fashioned crowd. I still believe that a man can't embrace a woman and dance with her and have his mind on God, <laughs> unless it's his wife. Amen. <laughs> I used to think that I, I used to say, well, if y'all want to have a dance, we'll put two men together and two women together, but I can't do that anymore because that don't work. <laughs> the whole thing is messed up. <laughs> I was preaching, I was preaching on dancing. This 80-year-old woman couldn't have danced if she wanted to. Was just having a time hollering, amen. I saw what she was doing, had a bunch of teenagers over here that had come. So in a minute I turned to gossip. I said, some of you got a tongue long enough to carpet this aisle right here in this church. <laughs> well, boy, no longer did she. In fact, she clammed up. She hadn't said anything for the rest of the service. And the young people were saying, right on, right on. Boy, and she never came back, so I must have loaded her wagon while I had her. <laughs> what is sin? What are we going to do about it? Are we going to keep accepting the world's counsel? Are we going to let them set the pattern? Are we going to allow the world to tell us what's wrong and what's right? And even on movies, the world tries to grade them for us? How in the world can the world grade movies for believers? They don't even know what's right and wrong themselves. This is not an immoral society. It's an amoral society. Nothing's wrong anymore. Whatever you think is right, go ahead and do it. That's why the only unifying factor that we have is get back to a holy God. That's the unity of what we believe is let God speak and He is final authority. Well, Brother Bill, I've got an opinion. I'm sorry. God didn't ask you. <laughs> and He didn't ask me. He wrote it in the book and said, believe it. I may not understand it, but I believe it. It's the Word of God. Joshua has got a problem. God's angry. The anger of the Lord is kindled. A, natural, a supernatural response from an attribute of God. He just responds to sin. He hates sin. He detests sin. He can't stand it in my life, and he can't stand it in your life. And the only way that a sinner can get his name cleared in the presence of God is to run to the cross where sin has been laid on our substitute. And in that sin, God exhausted his judgment on Jesus. And the only way that you'll ever get saved is to run to Jesus, receive his finished work, and when you do, you're accepted in the beloved, and God has no judgment no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Well, Joshua responds, and they decide in chapter 7, and here's what they did. 
They had such a victory at Jericho. I mean, Jericho's walls came down, and now Joshua think he's got seniority with God. That's what usually happens when we have a little spiritual victory. We get so proud that God has to inject a problem get, to get us back on our face. That's the process of God. If you hadn't learned it, then God's not using you. God doesn't use people because they, he's talented or got ability. He used them because they know brokenness and the ability of God through their lives. Well, here is Joshua. Ai's before them, and here's what they do. He said, Ai's no problem. After all, look what we did at Jericho. But he forgot that Jericho's victory was not by human ingenuity or by man's technology. It was by the supernatural deliverance of the power of God. And when God gets ready to do something, he never uses somebody's, just nobody's, full of Jesus. Amen. Amen? That's tough for Baptists, but it's the truth anyway. <laughs> Joshua said, no need to send a big crowd up to Ai. Well, there's just a few. Pick out a few men, send them up there, and just whip, whip up on those folks and come on back home. Well, what he didn't know that God has a way of embarrassing people who act in independence instead of dependence. And when they went up there, Ai smote those Israelites and they came back de embarrassed and depressed. And I want you to hear what Joshua says in verse 6. And listen to it. Sound like the average preacher whenever he's had a problem. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put this dust upon their heads. He should have done that before he went up to Ai. Hey, folks, it's too, it's too late to act humble after you've acted on your own. He said, Lord, don't you see you embarrass me? And Joshua starts trying to work things out. Look at verse 7, and I like this. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us in the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we'd been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. Doesn't that sound like a whining church member to you? A whining preacher crying out and saying, God, why have you done that to us? And you know what he said? I wish I had a never come to spirit-filled living. I wish I'd have never come to Canaan. I wish I'd have never seen the Jordan miracle and the Jericho miracle. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God has to keep reminding us that what He does with us is by the enabling of the Holy Ghost. And He does it by the power of God so He can get all the glory. Joshua. Now look at verse 8. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall environ us around, and cut off our name from the earth. And listen to this. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? In other words, he's trying to blame God, and he's trying to make God feel bad. <laughs> hear him. Hey, God, what, what are you doing? And by the way, Lord, what are you going to do about your great name as if some human could degrade the name of God? When all these preachers were falling and when many of them were going down the tube and some of them whom had, who had the audience of this whole society and we thought the anointing of God was on them and they, and they gone. People said to me, won't that hurt the kingdom of God? I said, do you think now listen, do you think Bill Stafford, with whatever measure of success he's had, could ever hurt the kingdom of God? Hey, God knew I was a failure when he got me. <laughs> and don't you look like that, so are you. That's all God's ever used is failure. And I'd rather be a failure full of Jesus than a proud Christian without the glory of God on his life. And I've learned, if I learn one secret, God uses failures full of Jesus. Erwin Lutzer, Moody Church in Chicago, has written one book that I, and written many books, but one book that I wish every one of us had. Failure, the back door to success. Every one of us need it. 
You need to read it because every time you have a failure, it doesn't mean God's mad at you. It doesn't mean that God's not on you. It doesn't mean that God's not around. But I'm going to tell you something. What it does mean, he's bringing you down to the point that he can be everything in your life. And that's what he wants in the ministry and in our churches. God, what are you going to do about your name? Uh, your name's going to be hurt. Hey, we're talking about God, folks. <laughs> Amen? Nobody will ever hurt the name of God. He's above all and not pushed up. Under all and not pressed down. Around all and not pressed out. He's basic. He's central. He's preeminent. He is God. <laughs> he, he was, is, 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 and always will be, is. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about my God reigns. And he'll take somebody that could be an, alter, uh, an ultimate failure and through that man shake a world for God and shock a world at what he does with it. Now, that's introduction. <laughs> now, I want you to look at verse 10. God says to Joshua, <laughs> I love it, get up and shut up. <laughs> Read verse 10. Joshua, what you doing? I thought when you prayed, you was being spiritual. Here's Joshua on his face, really pleading to God. And while he's lying there, God looks down and says, <laughs> Joshua, what are you doing there? It ain't no time to pray. It's time to repent. There's sin in the camp. You know what we do when we start backsliding? We start building substitute works. We try to add stuff to our spiritual walk. And when the colder we get on God, the more works we add trying to build substitutes so we won't have to repent. And no repentance is mentioned in the church anymore. The altar call is nothing more than calling somebody to come and learn to manage their time or live with their mother-in-law. Amen. Brother, we need revival preaching that will call people to repentance. We need preachers to repent. We need deacons to repent. We need professors to repent. It's in repentance and brokenness before God that He stands me up under the anointing of the power of God. God uses people that know how to repent. God said, Joshua, get up and shut up. It's no time to pray. There's sin in the camp. Now then, I want you to come down to verse, if you will, look at verse uh, 15, 16. God gives Joshua the, 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 the key to exposing sin. Look at this. Verse 16. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. Now, I'm going to follow this verse by verse, and I want to show you what happened. Now, listen, he, here, here's the way it is. How in the world is Achan going to be found out? Out of three million people plus. How are you going to find him? He's got the golden wedge. He's got the Babylonian garments. They're hid in the, in the tent. Who's, I, how in the world are you going to find it out? It's all hidden away. And there's millions around him. It could be anybody's sin. Joshua doesn't know. Only God knows. But here it is, folks. When God gets ready to send revival, listen, when God gets ready to send revival, he always causes sin to surface. You didn't hear me. You see, there'll be no revival and a mighty moving of God until we get ready to call things what God calls them. You know, I've, I'm the kind of fellow that's got quite a temper. I'm Scotch-Irish. That's tight and temper. Giving is not natural to me. It's supernatural. I do it because God says so. It's a lot more fun to keep it. Well, you say, Brother Bill, I just naturally love to give. Well, God hates natural stuff. <laughs> lady come up one night and said, I just naturally love everybody. I said, God detests that. <laughs> Why? He didn't want natural love. Sinners can do that. Right. Amen? Yeah. God don't want natural. He wants me submitted and surrendered and Him loving through me beyond my capacity and even lets me love people I don't even like. <laughs> Amen? 
Why now, Brother Bill, that's not scriptural. Well, God loved you and he couldn't have liked you. <laughs> Amen. We were rebels, sinners, damned, doomed, indebted, depraved, lost. How could God have liked us? But he did love us. Amen. And in that love, he made us likable by the Holy Ghost of God. God said to Joshua, here's how I want you to do it, and I give you these three things. Number one, there's got to be an honest recognition of sin. You listen to me. Don't you ever get to the place that you're too big to say, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, and God, I'd rather die than to harbor this pride and hold on to my sin and lose the touch of God on my life. I'm just going to be honest with you. I believe if revival ever broke out in America, I believe we'd, we'd see preachers, deacons, Sunday school teachers, and we wouldn't be afraid to confess sin. We wouldn't care what the world thinks. We wouldn't care what the news media thinks. We wouldn't care what Newsweek's Times or whoever, eight Rolling Stones or whatever. We wouldn't care. Why? Because in such a desperate cry, Lord, you've got to do it. We need you, my grandchildren, my children. We've got to have revival. I need to be in your flow. I need the touch of God. We need personal revival. We've got to realize that what happens in this country will only happen through God's people under the power of God. You say, but Brother Bill, I think it's too far gone. Oh, wait a minute, folks. God's big enough to turn it around in a New York minute. Amen. And he will if he can start something with us. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to start them by a tribe at a time. Take them by tribes. Oh, there's three million plus. And so Joshua walks out and starts them by, tribe at a time. One, two. Well, Achan still's not too bothered because who's going to worry? We've still got a tribe of a lot of folks. And he still thinks his sin is covered. So the tribes come by. But in a minute, Judah walks by and God says, pull them out. Wow. It's getting closer. But still, Achan don't feel too bad. He's still lost in the crowd. How in the world is he going to find out? Surely somebody else has done the same thing because usually when we do something, we think everybody else is just as bad. So we don't bother to confess it because we can draw a measuring stick with somebody else's life and say, well, con compared to them, I'm not so bad. So we just let it ride. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. Things that I did not think was wrong years ago is wrong now. Because in my walk with God, and as you walk in the Spirit of God, and the holiness of God is revealed to you, things that you thought you could, you could go ahead and do then, you no longer do now because of influence and responsibility and a love for a lost world because you want to touch people for Jesus Christ. Joshua, he called them by, tribe at a time. Now, now look at verse, uh, look at verse uh, 18. And he brought his household. I mean, verse 17. And he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zerites, and he brought the family of Zerites man by man, and Zabda was taken. Uh oh, now it's getting a little closer. And he brought his he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi. And he goes on to talk. And verse 19, Joshua said, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Here's what I want you to see. Just as sure as we see revival in America, it's going to begin in the body of Christ. For if judgment begins at the house of God, what's the ungodly going to do? And if God wants to do a work, he's going to start it with a body of Christ, with us confess confessing and broken 
and coming before God and saying, Lord, I hate my temper. I hate my jealousy. I hate this gossip. I hate this greed. I hate this unkindness and unforgiving spirit. I can't stand this grudge I've got in my life. Lord, I'm tired of my coldness. I'm tired of my pride. I'm tired of my ego. I'm tired of bitterness and resentment. I am just sick of myself. Ladies and gentlemen, revival will come whenever God can pass us by one at a time and all of us say, my God, it's me, oh Lord. Boy, used to I could preach revival meetings and preach messages that I preach now and people would come to the altar in brokenness and tears and repentance and their whole life be changed. Now then, when you preach, you sense a, a state of rebellion, a dullness of hearing. You sense that people are saying, who are you? What do you think you are? And they can find them a preacher that suits their fancy. Boy, used to, when, the, you, when you went to the Baptist church, you heard hellfire and brimstone, judgment of God, and repent. You used to get mad and go to the Methodist church, and when you heard hellfire, brimstone, and repent. Then you went to the Presbyterian church, and he said the same thing. But we're now what we've got are a group of mama-called and pompous sent preachers whose one desire is to please a crowd who are afraid to be labeled as old-fashioned, as old lion. You know what a fellow said to me the other day? There ain't nobody going to come and hear you holler and scream at them. I said, then they'll just have to sit home. <laughs> oh, Brother Bill, no need to get excited. After all, we need a calm nice. Well, go ahead. If you want it that way, fine. But every once in a while, let me see you repent. Amen. We lived in our first pastorate by, by the church. We, I have five children. They're all grown and married now, 12 grandchildren. I never shall forget those times that my kids were riding the tricycle or their bicycle on the church parking lot. And I'd look up and see them headed toward the road. And they were going too fast to stop. Well, I didn't holler and say, hold it. I need a dialogue with you. Here's a book by Dr. Spock. <laughs> hold it. Now, let's see. What did he tell me? No. If I don't holler and I don't scream and say, stop, Brenda. Stop! Don't go any further. It's too late for dialogue. It's time to get broken and serious and earnest and honest. I want to tell you folks, a book by Dr. John Blanchard just came out. Whatever happened to hell? Get it. Read it. What's wrong in this society, Brother Bill? We're trying to give universal salvation to everybody without the blood, without God's work on the cross, without the gift of His Son. I don't believe it happens that way. I believe God so loved the world that He gave us Jesus so we could have eternal life when we cast ourselves on the finished work of the cross. I will not accept at all watering down the preaching of the Word of God. And I may be out of place. And I'm not even preaching for your applause. I want you to know that. Because I'd preach whether you applauded or not. Okay? And I've done reached the point of no return. Got more, too much behind me and so much more ahead of me. Praise God. All I want to do is finish my course with joy and be an old-fashioned heralder of the sufficiency of Jesus and the cross of Calvary and not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Oh, I don't worry. I've always been considered a little Pentecostal. <laughs> but at least nobody's ever told me I was dead. Bring them by. Tribe. Pull out Judah. Now bring them by families. Pull out the family. Now bring them man by man. And then he comes down to the point that he says, Achan is the man. You know, one, one thing I've learned about my personal life, that God doesn't expose other people's sins to me to help them confess them. He exposes mine. 
I've never, have you ever seen these people walk up to you and say, Brother Stafford, I've got a word from God for you? I said, well, tell him to tell me. I'm in tune. I'm not deaf. <laughs> you know, have you, people trying to be spiritual. Have you ever seen super saints trying to be spiritual like a dog trying to be a dog? They're sick. They look like a pig in a parachute. <laughs> Amen. What are you saying? You can't be spiritual. Christ is your spirituality. You can't be godly. Christ is your godliness. You can't be righteous. Christ is your righteousness. Every one of us are in the same boat. No seniority, no super saints, no big shots, no little shots. Bunch ought to be shot. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a revival of brokenness and love that will bring us all right back to the foot of the cross, amazed that Christ inhabits us by the power of the Holy Spirit. There must be an honest, honest recognition of sin. Secondly, there must be a, there must be a total confession of it. One of the hardest things I ever had to learn to do is that just because I'm a Stafford, I can't justify Stafford's hereditary nature. I can't justify temper. I can't justify greed. I can't justify bitterness. You see, the big problem of, of, of this is we're trying to win souls with a few people that want to walk with God when if we had Holy Ghost revival, everybody would walk out of here tonight flaming evangels. You couldn't help but tell it. Amen? You'd have the spiritual can't help it. I just can't help but share it. Bring them by. And then they pulled out Achan and said, What in the world have you done? What have you done? And he revealed it all and said, I have taken the Babylonian garments and I've taken the golden wedge. They are hidden in my tent. And ladies and gentlemen, he came clean with it all. Every revival I've ever seen break out where we had Holy Ghost revival meetings was after mm, a week of honest restitution, restitution and confession and getting right with each other to where there was such a cleansing in the church, the power of God just moved in. As in Jacksonville, Florida. In fact, these two right here on the, on the third seat on the end was in that revival meeting and that's where this young man was called to preach and the power of God sat down on his life. I was preaching, I'd preach Sunday through uh, Sunday morning, I was there eight days. Sunday night we came back for the last service and I preached about 27 minutes on the second coming of Christ. No emotion, just biblical, doctrinal second coming of Christ. Gave the invitation at 20 minutes till 8. It's typical. Nothing didn't seem to be unusual until all of a sudden I looked up and people were coming by the droves. I mean, folks, you, do you know how long that invitation went? From 20 minutes till 8 till 11 o'clock. Now, I'm glad they're here because a lot of evangelists won't tell it straight. But I'm here to tell you, I've got witnesses that got right with God. His folks were saved in that meeting. I mean, and he got right in that meeting and he's here as a preacher of the word tonight because of Holy Ghost revival. Twenty, you, do you know how many people came forward? I'd give the invitation a while, then Dr. Hudson would give it a while. They'd sing a while, have others. Hey, when you go, when you give an invitation for three hours and 20 minutes, hey, it's tiring. Uh, everybody sung everything they know to sing. I said everything I knew to say. And you'd say, well, we better close now. And in a minute here, here comes some more like just a big wave of glory. Crying, squalling, getting right with God. 185 people came forward. And we counseled them till after midnight. After midnight. And now that came so many people saved. When I go into Jacksonville, Florida, I look out across the auditorium, and boy, do I ever give the devil a run for his money. <laughs> Woo! I say, hey, Satan, I may not be doing so hot right now, but look right back there. You see that lady right back there? God saved her, and she's so on fire for God, she's charging hell with water pistols. Amen. 
look down here and see this couple in that revival meeting touched by the power of God and all across the country these couples sprang up and said I got right with God here I got right with God here God called me to preach I'm going with Jesus folks that's glory Aiken what have you done and you confessed it there must be a confession of sin and then last I want you to look at verse 25 and Joshua said why hast thou troubled us the Lord shall trouble thee this day and all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones and they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day so the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor or the Valley of Trouble unto this day I want you to honestly confess it I want you to thirdly ruthlessly deal with it bury it put it away repent confess it turn away I believe this kind of cleansing and this kind of repentance and this kind of turning will bring revival to America and listen it's either revival revolution or the rapture one or the other we are going to have to rise up and believe God he can use us to turn this nation nation around by the power of God Amen. listen to me one man in Wales one man was responsible for saying Lord bend me bend me bend me and through that broken man come the flow of Holy Ghost power and revival broke out Duncan Campbell went to the island of the Hebrides one man walked away from a big convention of 1500 people and said to the superintendent I've got to go to the Hebrides God's telling me they're waiting for me over there to come and preach and Duncan Campbell walked away from that big convention took a ferry to the island of the Hebrides and walked on the island and said I'm Duncan Campbell to a little lad there about 12 years old he said, sir, your name's been called in prayer here over and over, and there's five men up yonder praying for revival on this island, and they're asking God to send you to the Hebrides. And he went up and met those men, and those five men had been praying for years for a moving of God on that island. Started church, started church services, people started coming. First two nights it was dead, nothing happened. But the third night he preached. Walked out and thought nothing had happened put his hat on and started out on the porch of the church and a man ran up and said take your hat off Mr. Campbell God has shown up and said I looked out and people were lying prostrate on their face crying out in repentance and said sinners were running to us saying I don't want to die in my sins I don't want to go to hell I want to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ and every individual on the island of the Hebrides were touched with Holy Ghost revival. Can he do it again? Can't God do it again? Could he start it on the campus of Southeastern Seminary? Could it be right here through me and through you that God could sit down and say, I want you to get your sins confessed. I want you to get your self-life under control, surrendered to God. And I want you to cleanse your life to where I can move in power and touch a world for God. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is waiting for us to rise up and claim what we are and see a moving of God across this country. And to you that are lost here tonight, I want to tell you, Jesus Christ loved you so much that he allowed, he went to the cross and allowed God to lay on him your sin debt and mine. And as a substitute, bore our sins away in his death, burial, and resurrection. And if you'll come and cast yourself on him tonight and say, Lord, I want to know you. I want to trust you as my Savior. I trust your finished work. He'll save you tonight. Spurgeon said, 
I have been criticized, and I've got his write-up right here in my portfolio if you want to read it. Spurgeon said, Somebody asked him, Why do you preach with such tears and brokenness, and you preach with such fervor? He said, Because I know that some of the people I'm preaching to probably will go to hell, and I don't want them to go. And if they do go, I want them to know that they're going to have to leap over my body and walk over my tears and walk through my broken heart. And then I'm going to grab their knees and hang on to them and implore them in the Holy Ghost. They're going to have to drag me along. Why? I don't want them to go. I don't want them to go. Lord, would it be wonderful if we had that kind of revival to break out on campus here? Lord, I don't want them to go. I don't want them to go. That's the motive. That's the drive. That's the burden. That's the tears. That's the agony that God recognizes when we get serious and earnest. I don't want you to die in your sins. And I don't want you to go to hell. And tonight, I ask you in Jesus' name, would you walk out of that seat in just a few moments? We've got counselors here. We've got people to help you. I'll help you. We've got all the help we need. I'm going to ask you to step out of your seat. If you're saved and need to get cleansed, let's come for cleansing. If you're lost and need to be saved, we've got people here that want to love you to Christ. I'm going to ask you to come in just a moment. Let's stand together, will you? Heads bowed and eyes closed. We're going to sing just as I am without one plea. We know it by heart. And I would like to ask you if you would sing it reverently with your heads bowed, praying for the one by you. Sing it to the one by you. Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come. Sinner, backslider, whoever you are, come home to God. The counselors are here. If you'll come and just stand around the front here, be ready to greet those that are coming. And I want you to pray for the one around you and lay your arm around them and say, I'll go with you. Just come. Ask God to do a fresh work in your life. If you need to be saved, come and let us love you. Father, in Jesus' name, will you give this invitation in the power of the Holy Spirit and may people know that we don't want them to die in their sins. We don't want them to go to hell. Help them to come. And then, Lord, for we who are saved, may we not leave here till we've done business with a holy God. And we'll praise you in Christ's name and for his glory. While heads are bowed, while we sing together, who will be the first out of the seat and say, Preacher, I want to meet with God tonight. Come while we sing. Will you come? Some are coming. That's it. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Just come on right now.